Welcome to Lesson 2 of Unit 1 um, for Federal Government for TCC. Um, we're going to talk today about the Constitution, which is something that I absolutely love to talk about, but I'm not going to lie, there's um, a little bit of history here at the front, and so um, hang with me. It's going to go from history to actual government class, um, you know, how, about midway through. So, but first we got to see kind of where we came from and why we got to where we are. So the question is, why um, has a government been instituted at all? Why didn't we just break free from the king and the monarchy in England and everybody just do their own thing? Because as one of the founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton said, because the passions of man will not conform to the dictates of reason and justice without constraint. Now, um, I want to make a couple of comments about this slide. So this is my Alexander Hamilton. This is Lin-Manuel Miranda, who wrote the musical Hamilton, giant Broadway hit. You can watch it now on Disney+, Plus, which is um, a huge treat. And I would recommend watching it on Disney Plus because it is um, a really great personalization and retelling of the story of the Founding Fathers and how we got to where we are now. And if that just um, sounded like a horribly boring way to spend an hour and a half on a Saturday afternoon, I'm so sorry because I have not done it justice. It is um, a really groundbreaking, interesting musical, super, super catchy music. And um, it's one of those things where when you finish watching it, you're like, I had no idea I actually cared so much about um, the founding of the United States. So um, one thing, though, that I need to point out and that I need you to know, Alexander Hamilton was never a president. He's on the $10 bill, yes. He was um, Secretary of Treasury, and so, which is how he got to be on the $10 bill, but he was never president. So there probably will be an extra credit question on a test and on a quiz, and probably again on another test. Um, and the answer is always going to be, Alexander Hamilton was never a president. So let's talk about the story of the founding of our nation. So in the 1600, early 1600s, um, the first colonists came from England to America. So, you know, the pilgrims, the people that were um, coming to America to help establish um, the colonies here. And then um, fast forward 150 years or so in um, 1754 to 1763 was the French and Indian War, which um, left England with a lot of debt. Um, that is something that um, kind of is the um, theme that uh, runs under the next few hundred years because um, it's England's debt that we had nothing to do with as um, colonists that um, leads to kind of the oppression that we started feeling from England. So in order to try to help the economy in um, England recover from all of the debt that was incurred with the war, um, the Stamp Act, Act was enacted in March of, 19, of 1765, sorry. And what that was is um, it was, if you had a newspaper or a business document, it had to have a stamp on it and the stamp was um, a tax. And so you paid a certain tax and then you could get a stamp and then your document could be legal or you could sell your newspapers. Um, so the Stamp Act was enacted and colonists complained that this was not a fair thing to um, make us pay. And Parliament back in England acquiesced and said, okay, fine, you don't have to 
um, adhere to the Stamp Act in your newspapers, things like that. So a couple of years later, there is the Townsend Act, and that is um, an act that taxed glass, paper, tea, and lead. And so it was taxing things that were, you know, basic things that were needed in all different kinds of industries needed by everybody, basically. Um, again, the colonists complained that we were paying taxes to England on um, these, you know, goods. And Parliament again acquiesced and said, OK, fine, you don't have to pay the tax on glass, paper or lead, but you do have to pay the tax on tea. You see where this is going. So in Boston in um, December of 1773, the colonists said, we're not going to pay for um, this, tea, this tax on tea. And in fact, to be very dramatic about it, um, they dumped all the tea into um, the Boston Harbor, the Boston Tea Party. Um, Parliament responded with a blockade. So um, sent a British blockade to the Boston Harbor saying, well, fine, if you're not going to pay for the tax on tea, then no tea is coming in. Nothing is going out. Um, you are going to basically just be trapped here. And, um, you know, until you figure out a way to be able to live with paying a tax on tea. As you can imagine, um, that didn't go very well. So um, this is, you know, the climate right before the Constitution is written. We had just come from England, were subject to the rule of the monarchy and parliament, but we as Americans, as colonists, did not have any representation in parliament. We were still considered British, British subjects, but while people who lived in Britain had actual representation in Parliament, um, the people who were the colonists did not. So we, the colonists, wanted to be on our own. We didn't want to send money to England to pay for things because all we were doing was funding a war debt that we didn't have anything to do with and um, or funding a palace or some other improvements in in England that we were not going to enjoy the benefits of um, and we didn't want to have to pay these taxes if we were not in Parliament and able to at least voice our opinions or um, express our concerns or agree to paying the taxes So in 1774, the um, Continental Congress um, met and they it was a group of the founding fathers who met in Philadelphia and um, we sent a document um, to England saying that we want our own council for taxation. We don't want British troops here in the colonies anymore. Um, making us, you know, follow rules that were enacted by people across the sea. And we wanted to have all of our, um, you know, criminals or disputes and things settled by local trials with local juries. We didn't want um, them to be tried by um, people in England. Um, and so we sent this to um, King George. And King George said, no, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, again, this is Jonathan Groff as King George as um, in Hamilton the Musical. Didn't really look like this, but an excellent portrayal, I have to say. So after the failed um, plea that was by the Continental Congress, um, in April of 1775, the American Revolution begins. Um, it begins because um, at Lexington and Concord, there were British soldiers that were sent to capture John Hancock and Samuel Adams, who were um, two of the participants in 
um, the Continental or the con the Continental Congress in Philadelphia in 1774. That's a mouthful. Um, and so they were going to capture those guys, destroy um, the store of weapons that the militiamen were keeping, um, and this is where you get the you know the famous Paul Revere ride. He hears about that. He rides and warns them. And so by the time the redcoats are coming, by the time the um, British soldiers arrived, um, Hancock and Adams and the rest of the militia were ready for them. And um, this is, you know, the fighting is where the American Revolution began. So in um, 1776, there was a Declaration of Independence, and that's um, where Thomas Jefferson wrote um, down things that were, um, you know, expressed by others, the, the sentiments of the day. Um, he based the um, sentiments on the teachings of um, John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and um, philosophers, and said that um, the colonists wanted a social contract kind of government. It's the government where, you know, everybody has certain natural rights, unalienable rights, like life, liberty, and property. Um, and then if people kill or steal or violates the rights of another, then they will be dealt with because they have broken the contract. Um, so the people formed a social contract with the government where people give authority to the government to govern, and in exchange, government gives the people protection. Um, people don't give up their natural rights, like life, liberty, and property, like was given up in England. Um, people retain those rights. The government respects those natural rights. And um, the gov if the government does not respect all the people's natural rights, then the people don't have to submit to the rules of government. And so therefore, a rebellion is justified. And that is the basis of the Declaration of Independence saying, England, you guys have um, violated our certain natural rights. Um, and so because you have, we, as people, do not have to submit to your rules of government. We are going to be um, independent of your government. We are rebelling against you. And so that's where we get the language that is in the um, Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. These are the natural rights that Locke and Hobbes talked about. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, govern governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So this is the social contract. The government is given power by the people, and um, they are, you know, they're only um, power comes from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, basically the, um, you know, violates the unalienable rights, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So this is, you know, um, explaining, hey, England, you have violated the social contract. And so because you violated the social contract, we are not going to be bound by the contract to give you any power. So we're going to do this ourselves. So we send the um, Declaration of Independence, signed by everyone, um, to England in 1776. 
and in 1777 we established the Articles of Confederation, where we drew up this form of government where each state was separate and governed separately, and the only national authority was Congress. So there was no president, there was no um, central judiciary, um, there was just a Congress. Each state had one member of Congress and one vote, so the smallest state and the largest state had equal say in um, what Congress did. Um, you could amend the Articles of Confederation if there were 13 votes, so a unanimous um, requirement for amendment, but you could pass legislation if there were nine out of the 13 votes. Remember, there's only 13 states at this time, um, the 13 colonies. So um, if you wanted to get rid of the Articles of Confederation, everyone had to agree. But if you wanted to um, institute a law from Congress, you could do that with 913 out of 13 votes. And this is the um, way the states were entered into the Union. So in order, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maryland, South Carolina, New Hampshire, Virginia, New York, North Carolina, and Rhode Island. So this was it. You see that there's a big glaring spot in, um, there's no Vermont, there's no Maine, there's no West Virginia, there's um, no Ohio. This is, you know, this is the extent of the United States. At the time, there are the Articles of Confederation, where there are 13 separate governments that are governing. So what's the problem with the Articles of Confederation? Nobody's giving any money to Congress. Um, Congress is 13 people, mind you, but they don't have any money to do anything. So without any money, all they can do is um, pass, you know, regulations, but those regulations don't really have any teeth. Um, also, with no money, there's no centralized services being provided like a Navy, which is a problem because pretty much everybody has um, a border with the ocean and needs some kind of a Navy to protect themselves from Britain and from Spain. Um, Britain and Spain have navies. They can boat on over and um, land on the shores and nobody can do anything about it until they get off their boats. Um, Congress also could not regulate trade. So um, only those in the East had trade rules and um, nobody could tell one state or another state that the trade rules were unfair or that the trade rules had to be um, centralized. So seeing that this was not working out um, the way that we had planned, in 1787 there was a constitutional convention in Philadelphia, and there were some different plans that were laid out. There was um, the Virginia plan that said we need a centralized judiciary, we need a centralized executive branch, and we need a Congress that is chosen by a lower chamber and then the lower chamber is chosen by voters. So this sounds a lot like um, the Electoral College where they, the founders, the people who drew up the Virginia plan didn't really trust the voters to be able to choose who was in the Congress. So the voters would just choose this lower chamber or this you know, group of people who would then choose um, who should be serving in Congress. And then the federal government um, only had the power to regulate defense and interstate trade. So the federal government's not going to have power beyond just regulating defense, getting a navy, and interstate trade so that the trade rules were fair between the states. On the other side was the New, Jer New Jersey plan. And the New Jersey plan also said we need a centralized judiciary, we need a centralized executive branch, and we need Congress that is a single chamber. So none of this lower chamber, um, 
higher chamber, just basically people can elect members to Congress directly. Um, and the federal government would only have the power to tax and regulate commerce. Um, no other powers beyond that. So there had to be a compromise. Um, you couldn't, you know, the, the each state having their own government wasn't working. Um, there was the Virginia plan, the New Jersey plan, and um, we had to figure out a way to make those two plans work together, take the best parts of both of those plans. So everybody agreed we needed a centralized judiciary. Everybody agreed we needed a centralized executive. And then for Congress, um, we determined that there would be two chambers. So there was, you know, this upper chamber um, and a lower chamber. And so um, there was, you know, one chamber that had equal representation and then there would be another chamber that had proportionate representation. So we don't call them upper and lower now, but um, we call it the Senate and the House of Representatives. We have one that has equal representation. Every state has two senators. And then we have one that has proportionate representation, which is um, the House of Representatives, where states get more representatives, the more people um, that live in the state. So we get the Judiciary, Executive, Congress with the Senate and the House, but how do we decide how many um, representatives each state gets because how do we decide who is in the population? You have to remember at this time there were some of the colonies that had slaves and slaves weren't considered people like citizens that were part of the population. Um, they were considered um, goods. And um, this was something that was, you know, um, scary to the South because if you start taxing based on the number of um, goods or the imports or the exports that a state has, well then everybody will be taxed on the number of slaves they have. And the North said, it's not really fair if we count slaves as um, people who are in the population that should um, you know, be considered for the number of delegates you get in the House of Representatives um, because the slaves aren't able to vote, the slaves aren't, aren't um, having any input, it's just giving more power to the slave owners. So this is where the three-fifths compromise came in. Um, in order to um, satisfy and, and assuage these fears about um, slavery and trade, the Southern delegates are worried the North is going to tax or even bar importing slaves. Um, and they thought that if, the ta if Congress could tax the import and the export of goods, it would hurt the South because they're taxing the import and export of slaves. So not the export, but the import of slaves, the export of things like tobacco. Um, Congress could tax imports then, but not exports. Slaves were going to be allowed um, per the Constitution until 1808 with no mention being made of any um, kind of outcome to slavery. Basically, nobody could talk about it. Nobody could bring it up until 1808. They needed to see if this constitution could work for a few years at least before we started to try to um, unravel um, what the North saw as the slave problem. Um, and would that would give the Southerners um, you know, some way to agree to the Constitution, knowing that they were going to be able to continue with slavery until at least 1808 when, you know, it would be debated again. 
um, the three-fifths compromise was to count slaves as three-fifths of a person for apportioning seats in, a house, in the House of Representatives. So they weren't counted as, um, as a whole person. So for every slaves, you would count, um, for every five slaves, you would get three seats instead of five, or three votes instead of five votes, if that makes sense. And they were also counted as three-fifths of a person for taxing and apportioning votes. So they're not counted as a full person because they did not have full rights, but um, they were counted as lesser of a person because they were still there and still were part of the population. I think it's interesting to point out here that there were some framers um, of the Constitution that were very opposed to slavery, and those were Alexander Hamilton, Luther Martin, and Benjamin Franklin. So these guys um, were, were not fans of slavery. They thought that it was wrong, but they agreed that, okay, we're, we can debate it, but we'll wait till 1808. Um, the South, however, had their whole economy built on slavery. Um, and that was something that the, you know, the South was not going to agree to a constitution that specifically um, dealt with slavery, slavery or punished the South for having slaves. So with all of these details being um, debated and discussed and, um, you know, the, is the Constitution going to be um, ratified? Is everybody going to be on board? We need all of the states to be on board. How is this going to work? Um, there were two different groups, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The Federalists supported the Constitution and um, they thought the best way to get people to um, talking about and persuaded to also support the Constitution, they would write what they have called the Federalist Papers. And this was a group of essays um, that were written by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. And um, they wanted to um, explain different provisions of the Constitution, kind of correct misinformation or um, ambiguities that people were reluctant to ratify the Constitution because of. They um, wrote that the government, the government was created by the Constitution, would have the power to change the defects of the Articles of Confederation and use the power that the government had to ensure a secure and prosperous country without infringing on individual liberty or states' rights. So basically saying states are still going to have rights to govern themselves, rights to do whatever they want within the state. Um, individuals will still have their own liberty, you know, right to um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Obviously, there were problems with the Articles of Confederation that needed fixing, and this um, government was going to you know, tweak the Articles of Confederation in order to um, bring about a government that could help the nation um, stay together and stay um, prosperous and, you know, stay protected. But, like I said, there were anti-federalists. They did not, um, they were not on board with um, some of the things in the Constitution. They thought that the president, the executive branch, looked a whole lot like a monarchy. We have one person who is just like the king, who is in charge of everything. That sounds like what we just came from. Um, there was no Bill of Rights um, at that time, and so they thought that the federal government could just come in and decide what rights people were entitled to. So there was no, remember, things like freedom of speech and freedom of the press. All these things were not in the original Constitution. They were in the Bill of Rights. So if you don't have a Bill of Rights, then there's just these amorphous words about, you know, everybody's entitled to 
um, their rights, here's what the government looks like, that kind of thing, but they don't spill, spell out what rights um, people are entitled to. And so they didn't want the federal government just being able to interpret that. Um, the national government was a lot of elites instead of representatives of the people who elected them, like state governments are. So in state governments, you have um, just kind of whoever's in your state, um, those are the people who are going to be elected. But when you start talking about a national government with, um, you know, with presidents and with um, Supreme Court, things like that, um, you ha start having a lot of people in power who don't necessarily look like you, um, you know, the, the common folk in state government. So what was the solution? The Electoral College. And I know if you've heard anything in the news um, about the Electoral College, it is probably how the Electoral College should be banished. Um, Electoral College was formed to lessen the concern that the president would be a king. So we didn't trust people to vote um, directly for the president of the United States. So we said the people will choose electors and electors will choose who is going to be um, president. And so um, that was kind of a buffer between the, um, the common folk who could be easily persuaded to vote for somebody who was a king, um, who ended up being a king, and it would um, allow a little bit more control and a little bit more um, vetting of the people who are going to be elected president. The Anti-Federalists knew we needed economic cooperation. They knew that the Articles of Confederation or Confederacy were not working, um, that we needed a stronger defense. So they just wanted to revise the Articles of Confederacy. So instead of just throwing them out and starting all over, they just wanted to um, tweak those articles so that they could um, take care of some of the issues that were coming up and were proving to be unworkable. Ratification was um, tricky because um, the plan was that all of the states must ratify a new form of government. Um, but at the Constitutional Convention, it was um, shown that um, there wasn't going to be any way to get everybody on board um, quick enough. And so um, the delegates at the Constitutional Convention said, we're going to change the rules and we're going to ratify the Constitution as long as nine of the 13 colonies um, will agree to it. So um, colonies number one through six ratified it quickly. So Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, they were quickly on board um, with the Constitution. The next group that followed right after them was Maryland, South Carolina, and New Hampshire. Um, but then, so they had their nine, but they really did want all 13. So, um, Virginia and New York said they're going to ratify, but only if you promise to write a Bill of Rights that is you know, going to be enacted basically alongside the Constitution. And then finally, the holdouts, North Carolina and Rhode Island, realized they were going to be the two odd guys out. And um, so they went ahead with everybody else. You don't want to be the last two or the only two that aren't participating if um, everybody else is getting the benefit of a national defense and the benefit of, you know, a strong central government. Now, this is, you know, the, the people at the Constitutional Convention, the delegates at the Constitutional Convention. Um, this is not the view of the regular people who are working the farms or um, running the businesses in the colonies. They did not favor ratification. Um, wealthy people liked this idea because it 
provided um, stability for an economy and it also provided um, more of a structure where they would be able to participate. Um, but once people saw that George Washington was going to be the first president, their fears of, oh gosh, the president is just going to be another king, um, were relieved because um, George Washington was you know, a general um, during the revolution and um, he was highly regarded, not um, was a reluctant leader so did not really want to be president, but surely did not want to be a king. And so this, um, this made everybody feel a little bit better about ratification. So let's talk about the Constitution. First thing I want to say about the Constitution that we have is it's very short. So if you, um, if you have an extra, you know, half hour or so, I would recommend reading it. It's not very long. Um, and it's interesting because when you hear people in the media talk about all of these, well, you know, I have a right to my social media account. Well, let's check the Constitution and see what you exactly have a right to. I don't think you have a right to social media account. You know, I have a right to free speech. You do, but let's look at the amendments and see you have the right to speak out in the government, not um, tell you that you can't speak, but you don't have the right to, um, you know, speak out and um, not be chastised by another private person or private company. So, but that's a tangent. I think the Constitution is great for a number of reasons, but let's talk about kind of objectively what are some great things about the Constitution? Number one, it provides for defense. Number two, it meets the needs of commerce, so it helps us to have a strong economy. Number three, it preserved the state's rights to govern, so it preserved with creating federalism, which allowed states to retain power alongside of the federal government. It um, preserved their right to govern themselves as they see fit. Um, number four, it divided power between the states and the national government. It created federalism. And number five, the national government was limited and representative. So it wasn't just a national government um, chosen by people in a certain um, sector of the country or a certain location It was who were governing everybody. It was people who were um, chosen from throughout the country to be part of the national government. So let's talk about um, some of this. It was a limited government. Um, so um, the, the thought was that an unrestricted majority rule can act irresponsibly, especially if there is panic created. So in order to deal with, um, you know, kind of a mob mentality or, um, you know, the whole country being um, kind of swayed to one way or the other because there was some sort of panic that caused everybody to um, kind of want to act in a certain way, um, the government was limited. So the government didn't have the power to do everything um, and do, do whatever the mob wanted it to do. Um, liberty is the right of individuals to be free to act and think as they choose, as long as they do not unreasonably infringe on the rights of others. And that's the big key. You can do whatever you want. You can think what you want to think. You can say what you want to say, but you can't unreasonably infringe on the rights of others. And this seems to be something that is pretty common sense, but it is something as we are seeing um, in our society in, you know, the 2020s of, um, of our time um, is kind of difficult to understand. It's kind of difficult to remember. So the government had to be able to enforce rules 
but it would also not be able to take away people's freedom to act and think as they choose without some guidelines. So there was going to be, you know, a, a, a framework by which the government would have to follow if the government is going to infringe on somebody's liberty or take somebody's rights away. The way the framers made sure that a limited government was going to last was by um, writing it into the Constitution. Um, they said that, you know, only powers granted to the federal government um, are listed in Article 1, Section 8, completely enumerated. Um, and they are, if they are not granted to the federal government, the central government, they are denied unless they're necessary and proper to carry out the granted powers. And so that's a little bit of a confusing way, but basically it's saying, here's a list of things you can do, national government. It's in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. But since we don't want to make a completely exhaustive list, we're going to say, and everything you need to, um, every action you need to take that is necessary and proper to um, be able to execute one of these powers in Article 1, Section 8. So we'll look at, the, at Article 1, Section 8 a little bit more closely, and that's going to um, show us exactly what, um, you know, what powers are given and also what the Necessary and Proper Clause um, is referring to. And then also the framers wrote into the Constitution that um, there were some powers that were denied. So um, the, the national government was not allowed to um, imprison someone for an extended period of time um, before they were given a right to trial. So the government can't just come snatch you up, throw you in jail, and leave you there except, and not give you a right to a trial. Um, every person was going to be able to stand up in their own defense and, um, you know, speak for themselves um, before they were imprisoned. The um, national government was not going to be able to pass a law that is retroactive, so they can't um, arrest you for something you did yesterday when it was legal if it's illegal today, if that makes sense. So you can't be tricky. The government can't be tricky. And the national government was um, not going to have any um, power to amend the Constitution by the people who were elected um, without having um, like the, you know, other people um, involved in the amendment. So if you're going to amend the Constitution, you have to let the states, you have to let the voters um, weigh in on that. The president can't just look at the Constitution and say, you know what, I'm not going to ask anybody about this, but I'm going to go ahead and just write in a few more lines or take out a few of these words um, to make my job easier. And so um, if the Constitution was going to be amended, it had to be amended with um, a majority of the um, voters who were voting. The framers also wrote in separation of powers. So this, um, you know, instead of just having a monarchy, there was um, a divided, you know, three branches of government, the judicial branch, the executive branch, and the legislative branch. And each branch was a check on uh, the other branches. Um, and the power was shared. No, no branch of government has exclusive um, total um, uncontroverted power to act in any certain realm. And we're going to talk about separation of powers in, you know, a few more slides, um, specifically because this was um, something that, you know, was was a new concept and it was a um, it was a complicated one to work through. OK, the fourth way that the um, framers of the Constitution um, made sure that there was a limited government was federalism. So the invention of federalism was dividing power between the state governments and the national governments. And the next um, 
the next lecture is going to be all about federalism, so we're going to leave that for, um, for then. The fifth way that limited government was written into the Constitution was um, the concept of judicial review. And what that means is that um, courts are able to review um, actions of, of Congress and um, executive orders, things like that. So the other two branches actions and can declare one of those actions void if it violates the Constitution. So it is kind of a, um, another built-in check of the legislative branch being tasked with being an expert in the Constitution and um, saying, hey, this, um, this law you passed or this order you passed, um, this treaty you made does not comply with the Constitution and so it is not gonna be enforceable. Number six was elections. That's a way that you can have a limited government um, because when you allow people the right to vote, you allow them to decide who is and who is not part of the national government. So if somebody acts like a fool while they're in um, power with the national government, then the voters can remove that person from office. And then also number seven, the Bill of Rights was a way to limit government because it spelled out in the first 10 amendments, rights that were given, rights that were um, taken away, what um, the national government must respect um, from the citizens, what the national government can and cannot do. So we're going to talk about a couple of these a little bit more um, in depth. The first one we're going to talk about in depth is separation of powers. And what is separation of powers? This is where we get um, checks and balances. So um, we have three branches of government, the legislative branch, which is Congress, the judicial branch, which is the federal judges and the Supreme Court, and then the executive branch, which is the president and then the people who are part of um, the president's staff. So the um, cabinet, you know, secretary of treasury, secretary of defense, things like that. So these three branches um, each have something that they are responsible for doing, but also something that they're responsible for watching. So Congress makes the laws, judges interpret the laws, and if the judges interpret that they are um, in violation of the Constitution, then they can void the laws. And then the president enters into treaties and appoints officials, does things like the executive branch. So um, when, a con when Congress makes a law, the court can interpret the law, inter interpret um, whether the, the law violates the Constitution, and if so, um, can say that the law is invalid. But when Congress makes a law, the president has to sign it. And so the executive um, has the power to veto um, the law. And so that is another check on legislative power. And then finally, within the legislature, both the House and the Senate have to pass a law. So if a law passes, um, a bill passes the House, but not the Senate, then it's not sent to the president to sign or veto, because, and so it can't be a law. So there's an internal check within the legislature. Um, the judicial branch interprets the laws, interprets the Constitution, um, but the judicial branch is chosen by the executive branch. So the president nominates Supreme Court justices when there's a vacancy. Um, the executive can also pardon someone who has been found um, to be in violation of a law. Um, Congress can say how big the judiciary is and what their jurisdiction is. So Congress is the one that says, you know, here's how big the Supreme Court's going to be. Um, they are going to have, you know, the right to act in these certain kinds of cases, you know, cases built on the, based on the Constitution. Um, and we're going to have X number of courts in each state. We're going to have, you know, 
this many judges, those kinds of things. And also, um, Congress can remove judges from office. So if um, if a Supreme Court justice just goes off the rails, Congress can um, remove vote to impeach and remove that justice um, just like they can with um, the President of the United States. And finally, Congress writes the laws. So judges can't um, say that something is or is not a law if there's not um, already a law that Congress has passed for them to interpret. So judges can't, the judicial branch can't just say, um, you know, the death penalty is, is illegal unless there is a law that is written saying the death penalty is legal and then the judges can interpret that law. And then finally, the executive branch, um, the president appoints people, um, officials, and also enters into treaties um, and has, you know, is a liaison with, you know, the rest of the world and with other nations. Um, but Congress, as we know, can impeach and vote to remove um, a president if a president does something that um, violates the Constitution. Um, also, Congress gives, decides how much money is um, given to the executive branch. So if, um, if Congress thinks that the executive branch is doing something that is, um, is not, um, you know, legal or does not fit with the Constitution or um, the way that the country should be run, then Congress can agree to not fund it. So while a president can um, decide whether or not we are going to enter into a war, Congress decides how much money the president can have for that war. So if, you know, if the president says we're going to war and Congress says, oh, well, you can, but you have $5 to fight that war with, well, then Congress has checked that power and said, we don't support this. And so you're not going to be able to, um, to sustain the war. And then finally, the judiciary can declare an action of the executive branch unlawful. So if, um, if the president does something that the judicial branch sees as um, in violation of the Constitution, then the judicial branch can um, invalidate that action. So I talked about Article 1, Section 8, which is the list of powers that um, Congress has. And so we um, are going to talk about these also in the next lecture about federalism, but I just wanted to go through what is specifically listed um, as powers that Congress has. The Congress has the power to lay and collect taxes, and so um, they are able to not only decide what taxes are able to be um, able to be instituted, but they also can collect them. Um, that includes duties, imposts, excises. Um, they can pay the debts and provide for the common defense and the general wel welfare of the United States. Um, all of these taxes and duties and imposts and excises, things like that, have to be uniform throughout the United States. So you have to be fair when you're um, enacting taxes, Congress. Um, they have the power to borrow money on the credit of the United States, and they have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with Indian tribes. So what this means is they can regulate interstate commerce, so commerce between New York and New Jersey, for example, um, commerce between all of the different states, as well as foreign nations. Um, they can establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform rule, uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. So this is really two parts. They are in charge of bankruptcy courts, um, bankruptcy laws, what you can, when you can and when you cannot declare bankruptcy and kind of what the procedures are for that. But also um, they establish a uniform rule of naturalization, meaning they can decide who and how people become citizens of the United States. 
Congress has the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof and a foreign coin and fix the standard of weights and measures. So what this means is um, they are able, there's going to be one common currency throughout the entire United States. Everybody's going to, instead of having 13 different currencies, we're going to have one currency and that's going to be regulated by um, Congress. And, you know, basically Texas can't just go and print all the dollar bills at once. Only Congress can be in charge of that. Um, Congress also provides for the punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin of the United States. So if somebody does just, you know, go off in New Jersey and print a whole bunch of dollar bills, then Congress, they have to answer to Congress for it. Um, they can establish post offices and post roads, which is, again, we want to be able to have um, one centralized postal department so that we can, you know, maintain some order and some uniformity um, when we want to mail letters. And um, Congress can promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. What does that mean? That means trademark and copyright. So they can protect somebody's work, um, artistic or scientific work, um, through copyrights and trademarks. And um, so for a certain period of time, you can't just go out and counterfeit or, or make your own um, copy of someone else's invention. Congress can also um, constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. This is where Congress gets the power to um, establish lower courts um, in addition to the Supreme Court. They can define and punish piracies and felonies committed at the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. So again, this is where Congress gets the power to um, punish certain criminals if the crime doesn't fit neatly into one of the state's um, jurisdictions. So somebody's out in the middle of um, the Atlantic Ocean, or let's say they're out in the middle of um, the water between New York and New Jersey, and a fight breaks out. Well, who gets to punish um, those people, New York or New Jersey? Well, either. Um, if it's a, you know, a piracy that's committed there, then um, the federal government is going to step in and um, Congress is going to punish those people or at least write laws that say what kind of punishment they are um, subject to. Congress can declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal, um, and make rules concerning captures on land and water. So this is a big one where Congress is allowed to um, declare war. And um, while you know a president can just send troops somewhere, um, Congress is the one who actually says we're I'm, we are all voting to um, say yay or nay on um, going to war here. Congress has the um, ability to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for longer the term than two years. So um, again, Congress is the one who says we're going to be able to. Um, a lot some money to support an army that is going to go fight in this war. They provide and maintain a navy. Again, this was a big deal for the framers of the Constitution. They wanted um, there to be a centralized navy. Congress can um, make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. Um, they, which is just basically, they can they make the rules for the navies and um, for the federal lands. They provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. So um, Congress can tell the militia um, that they have to, you know, federal officials can support um, 
the laws that were enacted and, and enforce the laws that are enacted and suppress insurrections, which we saw in January um, with the Capitol. Um, Congress can provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia and for governing such part as, of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, refer, reserving to the states respectively the appointment of the officers and the authority of the training of the militia according to the discipline preside, prescribed by Congress. So they have some say over who is going to be, um, you know, how the militia is going to be organized but um, they also are you know, going to give some of this power to the states to make sure that um, you know, the militia is well run and things like that, but they're going to give guidelines, but a lot of that's going to be carried out by the states too. So this is where we see federalism, um, where we see Congress having some say in a matter, but some of the power being shared um, and delegated to the states. So this is when they say the militia, we're talking about things like the National Guard that, um, you know, is is a federal thing versus just a state, um, a state thing. Um, Congress has the power to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such a district not exceeding 10 square miles as may um, by cessation of particular states and the acceptance of Congress become the seat of government of the United States and to exercise like authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of, the, of that state in which the same shall be for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. So this was just saying, when you have a district like the District of Columbia, where the government is housed, then Congress is the one who's in charge of that. There's not a, you know, there's not a um, state government because this is not a state. This is um, this is something else. This is a, a federal jurisdiction. So there we get Washington D.C. And to make, an all, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or any department or officer thereof. So this is the big catch-all, the necessary and proper clause. So this is where um, the framers said, look, we're not going to be able, we already listed out a whole lot of things that Congress can do, but we're not going to get into the weeds here and we're not going to really um, set forth any more guidelines. All we're going to say is they can make laws that are necessary and proper for um, enforcing and carrying out these powers that we've given them. So we talked about separation of powers, which is a way that the framers of the Constitution were limiting the government, making sure that the national government was not going to just run away with everything. And another way um, that they did this was by enacting the Bill of Rights. And remember, there were a couple states that said, we're not okay with this form of government unless there is some sort of a Bill of Rights that delineates exactly what kind of rights um, people have and what kind of rights the government cannot infringe on. So the Bill of Rights contains the rights that the government cannot deny um, of individuals. So the Bill of Rights is made up of 10 amendments, and we're going to go through those amendments one by one. The first amendment is Congress shall make no law. So the government, the national government, cannot make a law respecting an establishment of religion, prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, press, the right of the people to peaceably assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So this is number one, top of the list. Congress can't set up a national religion, and they can't prohibit people or forbid people from practicing their own religion. Um, they cannot... Um, censor or um, keep you from speaking or writing something in the press, and they cannot take away your right to peaceably assemble, and the peaceably is a big deal. So Congress can say, 
you can't do certain things like, you know, march into the Capitol with your guns. Um, but Congress can't say that you can't stand in a park during times when the park's open and, um, you know, have your sit in or have your rally or something like that, as long as it's peaceable. Um, and Congress can't say you can't speak ill of the government and you can't, um, we're not going to listen to any um, criticism, basically. Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This is um, much debated, Second Amendment. Um, does it mean that if you're in a well-regulated militia, you can keep and bear arms? Or does it mean, hey, we're just telling you why we think people should be able to keep and bear arms because things like a well-regulated militia are necessary to the security of a free state? We're not going to get into the debate about what the Second Amendment says um, because nobody can really, um, nobody has authoritatively been able to say exactly whether or not um, the Second Amendment allows everyone to have guns all the time everywhere or nobody to have guns anytime anywhere except if they're in a militia. Where we have fallen now is that you're allowed to have a gun if you um, follow certain parameters and you follow certain rules and you don't have certain um, issues that would suggest that maybe you shouldn't be somebody who's allowed to have a gun. So when you see here people say I have the right to bear arms, remember there's a, a tiny bit more to that amendment than just um, the right of the people to keep and bear arms. The Third Amendment no soldier shall in the time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner nor in any time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. So um, this was apparently a problem of um, the British government just forcing people to house um, soldiers. And so the framers thought, you know, we needed to bump this up in the Bill of Rights and make sure that we're clear that the government's not going to just force somebody to take on a bunch of soldiers um, and support them. So um, obviously a little bit more of a, of a tailored um, amendment for a tailored set of circumstances. The Fourth Amendment, and this is a big one in criminal law, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. This is preventing the government from just jumping in and running into your house and rifling through all your papers and looking through all of your drawers and trying to see if there's anything you're doing there that's bad. If they don't first say we suspect based on probable cause that or we because we have a reason to suspect that something bad is going on here and we're going to swear to it by an oath or affirmation um, and we're going to describe we think there's bad stuff in this person's garage um, and here's the bad stuff we think that's there um, and we want to be able to go in and look. So this is protecting you from unreasonable searches and seizures. The Fifth Amendment. This is when people say they plead the Fifth Amendment, um, meaning they're not going to testify against themselves. So um, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law, 
nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So there's a lot packed into this amendment too, the first part. Um, you, if you're going to be tried for a crime, they have to first take the information to a grand jury um, and say, hey, grand jury of peers, um, you know, group of people who are not interested in this case um, and just kind of random people chosen from the community. Here's the evidence we have. Are we going to be able to do we have enough to try this person um, for this crime? And if the grand jury says, yeah, you have enough to try them, they're not saying, yeah, we think the guy's guilty. They're saying, yeah, you have enough evidence. You're not just being a jerk here and trying to harass somebody. So sure, you can go on and um, proceed with a trial. So it's just kind of a gateway or a, a threshold that the government has to pass in order to drag somebody into court um, and make them stand trial. Except, of course, if they we're in a time of war and you're on a Navy boat or something like that, they can deal with things a little bit differently. But outside of those special circumstances, there has to be a grand jury. Um, the second thing is you're not going to be able to be tried for the same thing twice. So if the government tries you for murdering your neighbor then they and you get acquitted, the jury finds you not guilty, the government can't say, we really think that that person killed their neighbor. So we're going to try him again and we're going to try again and again and again until we get our guilty verdict. So that's um, you're not allowed to be tried for the same thing twice. And you can't be called to testify against yourself in a criminal case. And so that's very important. If you're called to testify in a civil case, so one where the only thing that might happen to you is that you have to pay some money um, and there's not any risk of jail time, you have to give testimony. Um, but if it's a criminal case, you don't have to, um, where you're facing jail time, you don't have to testify against yourself unless you want to. Um, and you can't be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So before somebody is executed, before somebody is thrown in jail, before somebody has to pay a lot of money or has their house taken away from them or has their property taken from them, they have the right to a trial. They have a right to um due process so you know the whole grand jury and um, the safeguards that are built into our legal system um, the government can't just go through and execute people for no reason at all and then um, no private property can be taken for public use without just compensation so realize that this doesn't say the government can't take private property. The ju government just has to give you just compensation. So you own a farm and the government needs to build a highway that's going to run through your farm. This, you can't say because of the Fifth Amendment, the government can't take this part of my farm to build a highway. Well, yeah, they can. They just have to give you just compensation. They just have to pay you in order to take that land. The Sixth Amendment. Um, Sixth Amendment is um, the right to a speedy trial is the big thing in the Sixth Amendment. And this deals with criminal prosecutions, so not civil cases. If you've ever been involved in a civil case, which is like a contract dispute or something like that, you know that it's not um, necessarily speedy. But in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial, so nothing secret here, by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature of and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him and have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. We want criminal cases to be fair. There's a lot at stake, your life, your liberty. Um, there's a lot at stake in a criminal case. So we want you to have a quick trial so that this doesn't drag on and, and ruin your life forever. We want it to be able to be public, 
none of this secret stuff um, where you're secretly tried and nobody knows what's going on. You are entitled to a jury, and that jury is just not from people in your accuser's family. They're from, you know, they're an impartial group from the district where your crime was committed, um, and you have to be told why you are being um, being tried. So this is where we get the Miranda rights. You have a right to remain silent. You have a right to um, a jury. You have a right to assistance of counsel. But also, this is where we get, um, you have to be told what exactly you've been arrested for. You can't just, um, you can't just be held um, indefinitely for a crime that you have no idea about what it is. You have the right to confront the witnesses, so they can't just have secret witnesses um, that offer testimony against you. You have to be able to question them and say, no, wait a second, why are you saying this? And that's why, you know, in court, um, you know, the witnesses have to come to court to testify. And if the witnesses aren't going to come to court, then they can't, their testimony can't be considered against you. And there has to be compulsory process for getting witnesses that are on your side to be dragged into court. So if you have somebody who's going to be able to say, well, he was with me the night in question, and so there's no way he could have committed the crime, you have to have a way to subpoena that person to get into court um, so that they can offer testimony in your favor. And also you have a right to, to assistance of counsel. And this is where we get, you know, if you can't afford counsel, one will be appointed for you. Seventh Amendment in suits at common law. So we're talking about um, things where there's just a dispute between two people, not a criminal action. Where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right to trial by jury shall be preserved and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court um, other than according to the rules of the common law. So you, if you have a contract dispute, you have a right to a jury. Um, if the amount in controversy, so the amount at issue is over $20, and um, you can't, the if the jury finds something, um, unless the law allows, you can't just have the jury's verdict thrown out and, um, you know, basically the, the judge do whatever they want. Um, Amendment 8, excessive bails shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. So very short amendment, a lot packed in there. So if you're going to set bail on someone, the bail has to be reasonable. It has to be something that they can pay um, unless there are extenuating circumstances, of course. Um, there can't be excessive fines imposed that are disproportionate to whatever the, um, the violation was. And there can't be cruel or unusual punishments inflicted. And so we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about the death penalty and whether certain things, um, whether the death penalty itself is cruel and unusual punishment, but whether the certain ways of carrying out the death penalty are cruel and unusual punishment. Basically, this is just saying we need to all act civilized and we're not going to um, do any of these weird medieval um, punishments. The Ninth Amendment, um, so the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So this is saying, this is where we get the framers worried that the government might come in and infringe on individual rights. This is the um, framers saying, just because we haven't talked about one of the rights that people have in this Constitution doesn't mean that the government can deny that person their right. There are other rights people have besides the rights that are listed here. Um, the government can't just go trouncing all over rights just because they're not specifically set out in the Constitution. And then the 10th Amendment, 
is um, the clause that is the catch-all that says powers not delegated to the United States, which is the central national government, by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So basically, if there's not a right in here that, um, or there's not a power in here that is given to the national government, then we're going to assume that the states have that power to act. So, um, you know, if states, the states have basically all the default power except for the ones that are stated in the Constitution. So we have talked about all of the different um, great things about what um, is in the Constitution, but I wanted to circle back a little bit. We've talked about the limited part of the government. Now let's talk about the representative part of the government. So a representative government, we, uh, we thought right at the beginning of the Constitution, right in the preamble, we should say, we the people. Um, and so this is saying we have a voice in the government, but we don't want, um, we're going to build in some protections because we don't want um, people that can be inflamed by a mob, um, don't want a tyranny of the majority, as they called it. Um, so in order to protect the um, representative government from um, people who can, you know, be whipped into a frenzy, um, we are going to have, you know, a little bit of a limit to the voice. But essentially, the government is going to be by the people. So the way that we are able to protect our government from, you know, the whims of a mob are by having um, a democratic republic. And so we, instead of having a pure democracy or a pure republican form of government, we have um, a democratic republic. So the democracy, a pure democracy, is where government is um, by the majority and that's either elect, elected directly or through representatives, and the government has absolute power, and the law is whatever the majority says it is. The power of the majority is not limited, so there are no checks on this power. Um, the majority decides exactly what the laws are, and then when someone else is a majority in the majority, then they decide what the laws are. We like the part about where um, the government is um, controlled by the majority, and we like the part with the representatives um, and the people actually having a say in who, um, who is in the majority. A republic is a government with limits on power, checks on power, and deliberation required before action. The majority power is subject to constitutional and institutional limits. So this is saying that, yes, the majority is going to be able to be in control. However, the majority can't just, you know, be elected and then throw out the Constitution. There's going to be checks on that power. And that's how we get to our form of government that combines these two. Some of the safeguards that um, protect our government from just the whims of the majority are the House of Representatives um, have frequent elections, and those are direct elections. So we, the actual people who are sitting here, boots on the ground, are the ones who cast our votes for the representatives in the House of Representatives. And we do that every two years. And so we can decide every two years whether somebody is doing a good job in the House of Representatives and deserves to be sent back, um, rehired for that job, or whether they should be fired from that job. However, because you don't want the government changing every two years, the Senate um, is um, the Senate is elected for longer terms. Now, originally. The Senate was chosen by state legislators who were pop popularly elected. Now they are um, directly elected. I directly vote for 
who I think should be a senator. But the longer terms um, allow for less of turnover in the government. Um, the president is elected by the Electoral College. And so um, we will talk about the Electoral College a little bit more in future lectures. But as you know, the Electoral College is where when I vote on election day for the president, I am just expressing my opinion to the Electoral College by saying, hey, Electoral College, this is who I think should be president. And then the Electoral College goes and casts the actual vote for president based on the rules of the state and the rules of, you know, of those electors and um, whether or not those um, what whether or not the people in their district or that they were subject to um, voted one way or the other so we'll talk about the electoral college there's a lot about the electoral college right now um, in the news after the 2020 election because there was a lot discussed about um, you know would the electoral college vote um, the way that the people in the state voted or would the Electoral College just go rogue and vote for whoever they wanted to? And then another um, limit and safeguard on the power of um, the Constitution and the power of our nation from being just, you know, overrun by whatever the mob thinks, um, the mob of people, I mean, not like organized crime, but um, is federal judges are appointed instead of elected. So they're appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. And this isn't just the Supreme Court. This is um, federal judges throughout the United States. And so because those are appointed and confirmed by the Senate, there's a little bit more insulation for that um, group and those people who have the power of, you know, interpreting the Constitution um, and they're not able to um, be subject to what um, the populace thinks. So staggered elections, indirect rule is less chance that, um, you know, some group of people is going to um, get whipped into a frenzy and um, try to take over the government, if that makes sense. So that is all for this lecture um, and now you are at the end of um, kind of the how we got the constitution um, where it came from and um, we're going to go next to talk about federalism